Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Tuesday, July 26, 2022. Dueling speeches in the nation's capital by former President Donald Trump and former Vice President Mike Pence. The first time since the inauguration of President Joe Biden that Donald Trump has been back in Washington. He spoke at the America First Agenda Summit, focusing on combating crime, but also touching on plenty of other issues, including his claims of election fraud in the presidential race of 2020 and the work of the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. Mike Pence at the Young America's Foundation Conservative Student Conference getting a question from the audience about whether he and Donald Trump are divided on the future of the Republican Party. Mike Pence says they may not differ on issues, but they do differ on focus that he, Pence, believes elections are about the future. We'll have remarks from both of them coming up. Consumer confidence dropping for the third straight month in July as high inflation tamps down demand for products and services. That according to the conference board's consumer confidence index. President Biden meeting with the chair of a South Korean large conglomerate announcing a pledge of $22 billion more in investment in U.S. manufacturing. That's on top of the $30 billion already promised. U.S. Senate advancing a bill to boost U.S. computer chip manufacturing and fund science programs. A bipartisan procedural vote indicating a clear shot to final passage this week. Biden administration launching the website heat.gov. Promoters say that it allows state and local government and also the American public make better decisions about what happen, what they do when it comes to uh, extreme heat. And Russia announcing it is pulling out of the International Space Station after 2024. We'll talk about the implications with a science and space reporter at Insider. We start with former President Donald Trump and former Vice President Mike Pence giving speeches in Washington, D.C., separate events. Associated Press writing that Trump's appearance in the nation's capital, his first trip back since January 20th, 2021, when President Joe Biden was sworn into office, comes as some who are mulling White House bids have been increasingly willing to challenge him directly. And those include Mike Pence. AP article adds this, their separate speeches came amid news that Pence's former chief of staff, Mark Short, has testified before a federal grand jury investigating the January 6, 2021 assault on the U.S. Capitol. Donald Trump at the America First Agenda Summit it's being held by the America First Policy Institute, which is a think tank created by veterans of the Trump presidential campaigns and White House and cabinet. The focus of the early part of the speech was crime. We know where these gangs operate, what streets they control. We even know their names. The police officers know their names. The problem is they're not allowed to do anything about it, and they want to. We need to get in there immediately, go into every drug den, every stash house, every hideaway, and round up the dealers and killers and the gang members and charge them with any and every crime that we find. And there are a lot of them, drug crimes, sex crimes. All sorts of crimes, vicious, vicious, horrible crimes like we've really never seen before, certainly not on a scale like this. We're a war zone. To lead this effort, a joint violent crime task force composed of the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security should be tasked with destroying these organizations. And the penalties should be very, very severe. If you look at countries throughout the world, the ones that don't have a drug problem are those that institute a very quick trial death penalty sentence for drug dealers. It sounds horrible, doesn't it? But you know what? That's the ones that don't have any problem. It doesn't take 15 years in court. It goes quickly and you absolutely you execute a drug dealer and you'll save 500 lives because they kill on average five hundred people. It's terrible to say, but you take a look at every country in this world that doesn't have a problem with drugs. They have a very strong death penalty for the people that sell drugs. If we're going to stop this scourge, It's time to get brutally tough on the dealers and traffickers and narco-terrorist cartels who are stealing over 200,000 American lives a year. And that's a very low number compared to what the real number is. It's a very low. Think of it. 200,000. You don't lose that in wars. 
You don't lose that in wars. And yes, these drug traffickers should and must receive the death penalty. Former President Donald Trump at the America First Agenda Summit held in Washington, D.C. Again, the host of it is the America First Policy Institute, which was created by people who had served in the Trump administration. The focus of the speech on crime, and you heard a portion, the speech, though, went on for an hour and a half, covered many issues, including the work of the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. Now we have the January 6th Unselect Committee of Political Hacks and Thugs. And it's the, think of this, these are hacks and thugs. These are the same people that we've been dealing with for four years, same people. And it's the very people who perpetrated the lies that I was an agent of Russia, like Adam Shifty Schiff and others who are standing before the same microphone, same thing, they get out and they say, oh, our country is suffering so badly because, and he knows the whole thing is a hoax. I said this the other day. He knew Russia, Russia was a hoax. Him, Hillary Clinton, the DNC, the Democrats. And he stood pompously before microphone. His head, as you know, I feel is shaped like a watermelon. He's a quite an unattractive man. Now see, they'll get me in trouble for that, Kellyanne, because by saying he's unattractive, they'll say, that's a horrible thing to say. But he said slightly worse about me. But think of this, he knows it's a hoax. He goes, not a stupid person, an evil person, a sick person in my opinion, but he goes before these same microphones and he said, President Donald Trump's son, Don Jr., will go to prison for what he's done with Russia. What kind of a man would say that my son will put yourself in my son's position, that he's going to prison on something that he doesn't even know about and that Adam Schiff knows is a hoax and a fairy tale and was made up. And the New York Times, Brett Stevens did a piece on it the other day. They admit now that it was a totally made up hoax. He's saying my son should go to prison and he knows it was a hoax. What kind of a human being can do that? Only a sick, evil, very bad human being. And now I have the same people there, the same people other than Janie who's the worst and uh, crying Adam Kinsinger, I watched him today, he's oh, I mean, these people are just, you know, but the same basic people are now going on this. And it's so unfair when you see what happened to BLM, when you see what happened to Antifa, when you see what happened to all of the killing, all of the killings that took place all over the country, and then what you see what they're doing to people that in some cases didn't even enter the building, and you see the way they're being tortured and handled so horribly. When you see Kamala Harris getting people out on bail that burned down buildings and killed people, and getting them out on bail, and you can't even get many of these people out on bail. What a sad thing. And something's gonna have to happen, because people are not gonna take it much longer. There's two sets of justice and we don't have to go into it, but nobody's ever seen what's happening today in our country. And they're doing the exact same thing with January 6th as they did with all these previous assaults in our country. So where does it stop? Where does it end? It probably doesn't stop because despite great outside dangers, our biggest threat in this country remains the sick, sinister, and evil people from within. Former President Donald Trump in Washington, D.C. at a summit titled the America First Agenda Summit. First time back in Washington since President Biden's inauguration. Across town earlier today, former Vice President Mike Pence speaking at the Young America's Foundation National Conservative Student Conference. As CNN reports it, the Indiana Republicans said the conservatives must focus on the future to win back America and laid out what he called a freedom agenda of conservative policy goals on everything from the economy to immigration to cultural fights over education. The speech hinted at a platform for a presidential campaign, which Pence may pursue in 2024. After that speech, Mike Pence taking a couple of questions from the students in the audience. One of them was about Donald Trump. 
Hi, Mr. Vice President. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for being here. Hi, uh, what's your name? And My name's Andrew Burchard. I go to Gettysburg College. Hi, Andrew. And my question is, uh, you, President Trump and yourself are both speaking this week in D.C., and there seems to be a divide between the two of you on your outlook on what the future of the conservative movement might be. So do you think that this divide extends to the rest of the conservative movement, like the general public, and what do you think we can do to alleviate it? Well, I will tell you that I couldn't be uh, more proud of the record of the Trump-Pence administration. I mean, for four years, we advanced the policies that I just described without apology. To promote a, a growing economy, to secure our border. We appointed more than 300 conservatives to our federal courts at every level, including three Supreme Court justices. We rebuild our military, all of what I described. And I'll always be grateful for the opportunity to serve as vice president. So I don't know that our movement is that divided. I don't, I don't know that the president and I differ on issues. But we may differ on focus. I, I truly do believe that elections are about the future. And that it's absolutely essential at a time when so many Americans are hurting, so many families are struggling, that we don't give way to the temptation to look back. But I think the time has come for us to offer a bold, positive agenda to bring America back. And I'll continue to carry that message all across this nation. Thanks, Edward. Former Vice President Mike Pence at the Young America's Foundation Student Conference being held in Washington, D.C. During his speech and the question-answer session, he only referred to former President Donald Trump by saying the Trump-Pence administration. Book publisher Simon & Schuster announcing that Mike Pence's autobiography will be published this November. It is titled, So Help Me God. A little blurb from the company says it's going to cover the inside story of the Trump administration by its second-highest-ranking official and of a profound faith that has guided Pence throughout his life. And also... Quote, it chronicles President Trump's severing of their relationship on January 6, 2021, when Pence kept his oath to the Constitution. Congressman Kevin McCarthy of California, minority leader, was at the same summit today as Donald Trump and commenting about what's ahead for the Republican Party. McCarthy hoping to become House Speaker if Republicans can get a majority after the November midterm elections. McCarthy said this as he was sitting beside Another former House Speaker, Newt Gingrich, Republican from Georgia. What an amazing crowd. And I can only imagine how many people are watching MTV. And there's a reason why. Because we know what happens when you change from America first agenda to America last. In a short time period, the pain that this administration has caused. The question Brooke asked about is, what lessons could we learn from 94? Do not assume we are given a majority. You have to earn a majority. And the one thing I will tell you, we're four seats away, but we can learn a lot from Speaker Gin Gingrich. I listen to him quite often. When he put together the contract with America, you want the country to have a contrast in elections. When we watch what Biden has done, the pain of inflation we have not felt in 40 years, but you have to explain what he has done to people. This has gone up 550%. If you're an American making about $50,000 a year, you now have to have $6,100 more just to break even to where you were before Biden came in. If you are paid on a salary, with inflation right now, you have now just lost more than one month's salary based upon what's going on. America cannot afford that. Then the crime within our streets, the border, that's now bringing us fentanyl, number one killer of Americans between the ages of 18 and 45. We are going to roll out the commitment to America. And we're going to let America make a decision which direction they want. America last or America first. And I promise you, we know the direction they're going to pick. And then it's going to be our responsibility to carry that through. To not just pass it in the House but pass it in the Senate and get it to the president's desk. And I believe in this next election, this is a 50-year election. Never before are we going to feel this type of opportunity 
in a year of redistricting. We can lock in a conservative majority for the decade. But remember this, only four times in the last 100 years has, a flat, has the House ever flipped from Democrat to Republican. And when the Democrats took over last time, you know what their number one bill was? To take care of themselves, to change the election law to protect them. You know what we're going to do? Our number one bill is going to be about protecting the American people, making us energy independent, lowering the gas price, making your streets safe, securing your border, and holding Washington accountable. That will be a breath of fresh air. Congressman Kevin McCarthy, Republican from California, the current House Minority Leader, hoping to become Speaker at the America First Agenda Summit today, sitting beside Congressman, former Congressman Newt Gingrich, who was Speaker of the House when the Republicans took the majority way back in 1994, and referring to what was put forth as the agenda then, the contract with America. President Joe Biden, still in isolation, recovering from COVID-19. He hopes for just a day or two more, meeting virtually today and talking about bringing jobs to the U.S. He had at the White House the chair of SK Group, a South Korean conglomerate, discussing the company's investments in U.S. manufacturing. Reuters writes that the SK Group chair, Che Taiwan, last year said the conglomerate, South Korea's second largest after Samsung, planned to invest about $52 billion in the U.S. through 2030. I'm sorry, as I said, I'm not with you in person, but I wanted to make sure that uh, to personally thank you for this historic announcement. You know, this path-breaking announcement represents clear evidence that the United States, Korea, and its allies are back and winning the technology competition of the 21st century. For folks at home, the SK Group is the second largest conglomerate in South Korea. And since I've been president, it has made significant investments in the United States. SK has already committed $30 billion in investment here, and today they're announcing another $22 billion in addition. That will grow their U.S. workforce from 4,000 to 20,000 workers by 2025. Investing in a range of advanced technologies, some of which Tony already mentioned, it, from semiconductors to large capacity batteries to electric vehicle chargers and to pharmaceuticals. And... Uh, and, and, and partnering with an iconic American company like Ford and, and Intel. This, this is incredible. Further proof that America is open for business. Proof that we're meeting the emergency and the climate crisis with urgency and opportunity and innovation to save the planet and create good paying jobs. President Joe Biden, during an online meeting with the SK Group chair, who is also Go, who also goes by the first English name, Anthony or Tony. That's who he's referring to. President Biden asking the chairman what more can be done to strengthen the partnership between the U.S. and his company. We believe uh, our view as uh, the United States as our most important business partners. But well, one thing we can work together as uh, building a, a skill pool, the workforce, that uh, that will be the crucial for the ensuring that America has a type of worker necessary to lead the next generation, the manufacturing economy. So we will work closely with the state and the community colleges to help ensure uh, that workers know what they need to know to lead the jobs in our facility. The federal, state, and the local coordination and uh, the deeper in, uh, investment in job training would help other companies to find the skill set they need and uh, invest more in here in U.S. as well. The SK Group chair, Tony Che, in the Roosevelt Room of the White House with President Biden on a computer monitor coming in remotely from uh, his residence in the White House as the president isolates for the final days recovering from a COVID-19 exposure. This from Bloomberg, U.S. consumer confidence declined in July to the lowest level since February 2021 on dimmer views of the economy amid persistent inflation. The conference board's index decreased for a third month to 95.7 from a doubtedly revised 98.4 reading in June, data Tuesday showed. At the White House, a news conference that included Brian Deese, chair of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. 
You've spent a lot of time in the White House as this week trying to explain why you believe that the that your the U.S. is not definitionally in a recession. But why should the average American, who is really concerned about their personal economic situation and their wages aren't increasing as fast as inflation, they're struggling to put food on the table, fill up their tank, why should they care if the U.S. is definitionally in a recession or not? Yeah, it's a great question. It was what I was, I was trying to underscore in terms of where the, the president really centers on in terms of his economic policy and his economic goals. At core, uh, what uh, his focus is and the direction to uh, his team is to say, are we putting in place the right policies and the right strategies that will help those working Americans, middle class families, um, achieve some measure of economic security and economic dignity uh, and uh, be able to have upward economic mobility as well. And I think if you look at the progress that we have made over the course of the last 18 months, we have made historic strides in many, in many uh, uh, areas, uh, not the least of which has been the pace of this historic economic recovery and the return of job growth, the increase in wages, particularly for those uh, at, at the bottom end, the equitable nature uh, of this recovery. And we have a serious inflation challenge which is hitting economies around the, uh, the globe, but is hitting Americans. And that's why you have a president that is focused uh, as acutely as he is on what we can do to actually lower prices right now. And I would say that you know the reduction in gas prices that you've seen over the last couple of weeks is providing some measure of breathing room, not enough, uh, but some measure of breathing room. The steps to pass the CHIPS bill, as we've discussed, will make a big difference in terms of not only jobs here in, the, in, in America, but increasing the supply, building the resilience of our supply chains, which we have seen have been so connected to increase costs. So those are, that's where the President's priorities are, uh, are, and that's where he's focused. This is about trying to actually improve the lives and outcomes of, of middle class families. Brian Dees chairs the White House Council of Economic Advisors with reporters in the White House briefing room. More federal government economic announcements expected this week. On Wednesday, the Federal Reserve will raise interest rates. It is expected, perhaps three quarters of a percentage point. And on Thursday, the Commerce Department puts out the report on the second quarter GDP, gross domestic product. The the change, if it if it turns out to be negative in the second quarter, that'll be two quarters in a row. On the U.S. House floor today, Congressman John Rose, Republican from Tennessee, says that means the U.S. is in recession. Madam Speaker, on Thursday, the Bureau of Economic Analysis will release its second quarter gross domestic product numbers, an overall measure of our country's economic output from April through June. For decades, a recession has been defined as two consecutive quarters of negative economic growth. Therefore, if Thursday's second quarter GDP number is in the negative, then by definition, the United States economy will be in a recession. However, that won't stop the White House from doing everything it can to deny the obvious. In fact, the White House Council of Economic Advisors is actively trying to change the definition of the word recession. In a blog posted, uh, published on July 21st, titled, quote, how do economists determine whether the economy is in a recession, close quote, the White House argues that it is unlikely that the decline in GDP in the first quarter of this year, even if followed by another GDP decline in the second quarter, indicates a recession, close quote. I hope these students, uh, I hope those students who will be taking Economics 101 in the fall are taking notes because the Biden administration is attempting to change the decades-old answers to the test questions for purely political purposes. Instead of President Biden and his administration attempting to bait and switch the public on the definition of a recession, they should change course on their policies that are crushing our economy and cre creating significant pain for millions of Americans. President Biden's disastrous economic policies are having a ripple effect on the housing market, on gas and food prices, real wages, and of course, overall inflation. Now, we'll find out on Thursday whether, by definition, we're in a recession. Congressman John Rose, Republican from Tennessee, on the House floor. Wall Street today, the Dow down 228. NASDAQ down 220, S&P down 45. 
International Monetary Fund cutting its global growth outlook for 2022 and 2023. The IMF's chief economist writing the outlook has darkened significantly since April. The world may soon be teetering on the edge of a global recession only two years after the last one. AAA says the cost of gasoline in the United States continues to fall. It's now $4.32 a gallon. That's down three cents since Monday, 17 cents in a week, 57 cents since last month. The U.S. Senate today advancing a bill to help U.S. semiconductor manufacturing and increase U.S. competitiveness with China. That's the goals from the writers of the bill. The procedural vote today passing 64 to 32, more than the 60 needed, and showing that final passage in the Senate could come soon comfortably. The new name of the bill, it's had several over the past year, is Chips and Science, because it includes those two big parts of the larger initial proposal. $52 billion for computer chip companies, about $100 billion in authorizations over five years for the National Science Foundation programs, and also creating regional technology hubs to support startup companies. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer speaking ahead of today's procedural vote. This morning, this morning, the Senate will draw a clear line in the sand that America's chip crisis and America's dwindling commitment to science and innovation will not continue under our watch. Within the next hour, the Senate will vote finally, finally, to move towards final passage of our Chips and Science Bill. That's what we're calling it, the Chips and Science Bill. That will put us in a position to finish the work on this bill before the end of the week, It's a major step for our economic security, our national security, our supply chains, and and in fact, for America's future, for America's future. I want to be clear. The proposal we're passing this week contains the majority of key science and innovation measures that the Senate passed last summer. It will make historic investments to scientific research. It will take direct aim at our nation's chip crisis, Alongside the infrastructure law and our recent gun safety bill, among others, it is one of the most consequential bipartisan achievements of this Congress. I thank all of my Senate colleagues on both sides of the aisle who are helping to make this happen. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, a Democrat from New York, today on the Senate floor before that vote, the procedural vote that did pass. A number of Republicans opposing it, but not the minority leader, Mitch McConnell, who took a question today. What do you say to conservatives who say that this CHIPS bill is way too big, it is focused exclusively on one industry, it's too much money for that industry, you voted yes, and the folks vote today, how do you defend it? Yeah, I, I think this is about national security and um, about making sure we have uh, uh, adequate supply here at home of things that are absolutely indispensable. I wish that were inexpensive, but in this particular situation, it's not. Senator Mitch McConnell, the minority leader, Republican from Kentucky, with reporters. When this latest version of this bill passes the Senate, it'll head over to the House. Speaker Nancy Pelosi, a Democrat from California, says that there will be a vote in the House before Congress leaves for the August recess. And if it passes there, it would go to President Biden for his expected signature into law. Republican Congressman Jason Smith of Missouri, ranking member on the Budget Committee today, asked about this bill, interviewed by Larry Kudlow, who was former director of the National Economic Council in the Donald Trump White House. Wouldn't it be better, um, instead of picking winners and losers here, to just extend the 100 percent expensing provision uh, for plants and equipment and machinery? This would help the chip industry. Uh, but it also would help every other industry. My concern, and you know, we had this discussion in the White House towards the end, and President Trump never really wanted uh, this kind of assistance. He didn't like uh, putting money for, you know, picking winners. He would say, all right, you want subsidized chips, well, why don't we subsidize pharmas? Why don't we subsidize steel? They're all important. They're all important. I mean, we we have to have a strong defense. We're going to need steel. We're going to need aluminum. We're going to need a lot. We're going to need oil and gas. So why not extend the expensing provision? Why not make the research and development tax credit? You could expense that 100 percent, by the way. Um, 
Kevin Brady's stuff coming out of Ways and Means just shows how much less that would cost. You follow? And then we don't have, we'd, we'd help all of industry and we'd develop more onshoring incentives, et cetera, et cetera. So it'd be a whole lot cheaper. Yeah. First off, in regards to the chips bill, um, a huge concern. We talk about mandatory spending. Mm -hmm. This adds billions of dollars of more mandatory spending that takes away takes away discretionary spending from Congress. I didn't know this about ma mandatory side. It does. And so there is a better way to have a better chips bill without the mandatory spending. But when you're talking about the tax policy, that's what's what's on the ballot in November. That's why this election is so important, because our policies, our ways is to make expensing 100 percent permanent or at least extend it because it ex it's starting to phase out this year. 199A, which is the 20 percent deduction for small businesses, which make up more than 80 to 90 percent of all the businesses that expires in 2025. Uh, R&D tax credit, it's expired right now, which Senator Young tried very aggressively to get it on the chips bill over in the Senate side. These I didn't are, know that. These are things that have to be done, and that's what will turn the economy around. Congressman Jason Smith, Republican from Missouri, ranking member on the Budget Committee, with Larry Kudlow, former director of the White House National Economic Council under former President Trump, at today's America First Agenda Summit, Larry Kudlow, part of the think tank of former Trump officials, hosting it. Washington Today continues in a moment. With the inflation rate high, chances are this fall's midterm elections will feature campaign ads talking about prices. And likely ads in the 2024 presidential campaign will mention inflation too. It would hardly be the first time inflation was a theme of a presidential campaign commercial. I'm Jimmy Carter. The problem isn't six and a half percent inflation. That's just something written on a piece of paper. The problem is how can a family pay those grocery bills and keep up with the mortgage and taxes and pay for a college education? People work hard and they should be able to keep what they work for. I want a chance to give back to you the security and the hopes for tomorrow that inflation is stealing from you. With your help, we can do it. You can depend on it. Inflation and consumer prices have been topics of presidential campaign ads for seven decades. Hear the most powerful ones in the next episode of C-SPAN's podcast, The Weekly. C-SPAN's The Weekly. Find it and follow wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the free C-SPAN Now mobile video app and wherever you get your podcasts. From the Associated Press, Russia will pull out of the International Space Station after 2024 and focus on building its own orbiting outpost, the country's new space chief said Tuesday amid high tensions between Moscow and the West over the fighting in Ukraine. Yuri Bar Borisov, appointed this month to lead the space state space agency, said during a meeting with President of Vladimir Putin that Russia will fulfill its obligations to its partners before it leaves he said the decision to leave the station after 2024 has been made. I think that by that time we will start forming a Russian orbiting station. Some reaction today from the U.S. State Department spokesman Ned Price. Russia announcing that it will no longer participate after 2024 in the International Space Station. Uh, how does the United States feel about this? Does it have confirmation that this is the case? How will it affect the space program? We've space seen Russia's statement that uh, it plans to leave the International Space Station after 2024. Uh, it's an unfortunate development given the critical scientific work performed at the ISS, uh, the valuable professional collaboration our space agencies have had over the years, uh, and especially in light of our renewed agreement uh, on space flight uh, cooperation. I expect NASA will have uh, more details for you. Uh, do you hope that they'll revisit this, or do you think is that something that's underway negotiations to or to some any sort of discussion about this? With uh, I, I understand that we were taken by surprise uh, by the public statement that went out. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, I'm not aware that uh, discussions on on this front have started yet, but would need to refer you to NASA for that. I know that you don't like to talk about history, but since you mentioned it in, in relation to Peter Peter the Great and, uh, and, and Foreign Minister Lavrov and, and, and President Putin, given that Peter the Great also was the one who opened up Russia to the West, went on a grand tour of Europe, built Russia, the, what was then the modern Russian Navy. Uh, do you find it 
at all uh, jarring that they would pull out of uh, a scientific thing like the ISS now, given their given, given President Putin's apparent desire to be seen as a modern day explorer. I, I will leave that to uh, the Russians to speak to their motivations. Uh, here, I will just note that uh, the United States and Russia, we have cooperated on space exploration uh, for uh, years now, over the course uh, of decades. Uh, we obviously, um, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has obviously changed uh, our relationship fundamentally, but there are still aspects of our, our relationship, uh, including our joint pursuits in science, joint pursuits uh, in safety, people-to-people -people ties uh, that we would like to see preserved, uh, and the Russians are sending uh, a contrary signal here. State Department spokesman Ned Price with reporters in the State Department briefing room. Joining us now is science and space reporter for Insider, Morgan McFall Johnson. Thank you very much that, for being here. The, the State Department says that this announcement by Russia pulling out of the ISS was a surprise. What do you make of that? Hey, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I don't think that it is much of a surprise for a lot of space industry analysts um, and just people who are wrapped up in the space industry very deeply. Uh, Russia, Roscosmos leaders have been making statements like this for a while. Dmitry Rogozin, who was previously the head of Roscosmos before this month, made these kinds of comments all the time. They weren't necessarily as strongly worded as the decision has been made, but it's really important to note that um, Yuri Borisov said that they made a decision about withdrawing from the station after 2024, which is a huge hedge. That could mean 2030, which is the expected lifetime of the station, and everybody knew that Russia was going to pull out at some point by then. Um, so it, it does sound very shocking, but it's really not that much of a change in stance. But from a, a larger, the U.S. has been working with Russia and before that the Soviet Union for decades. What would it mean mm -hmm. if that collaboration does come to an end? Yeah, I think both parties have been preparing for that collaboration to end or at least for the International Space Station element of it to end for a while. Um, it would mean, well, both parties are taking their own path to the moon, which is the next step for a lot of space powers. China is also headed to the moon and has plans to build a base there, just like the U.S. does. Uh, and Russia has been in talks with China about that. So the these big space powers are kind of splitting up uh, on their own trajectories towards the moon. Russia has been talking about launching its own space station. NASA is planning to transition to commercial space stations. So it just means uh, less collaboration in Earth orbit, at least, and um, probably on the way to the moon as well. On, on that note, does Russia have the ability to build its own space station again? That's a big question. Obviously, a lot of things are kind of up in the air for Russia right now, generally. Um, and there were some uh, analysts talking to the New York Times today about how Russia has kind of lost quite a bit of resources uh, over the last year, uh, the last two years, really, because NASA astronauts have started getting rides to orbit uh, through SpaceX. And NASA was really dependent on Russia for uh, moving astronauts to and from the space station for about a decade there. And Russia, Russia's space program got a lot of revenue from that. Uh, but NASA isn't relying on Russia anymore. Other countries that want to put their astronauts into orbit can now look to uh, commercial U.S. companies to do that, like SpaceX. So um, Russia is kind of in this interesting position. It's also losing a lot of its collaboration with Europe. So its resources are getting limited. So that is a big question going forward. We're talking with Morgan McFall Johnson from Insider. We use the word collaboration before and that's ending. Some may look at this and say actually we're entering another space race and this one might not be so friendly. How do you see it happening with the the US, Russia and China all launching now into a further space exploration and you know, the U.S. has now begun a space force. Right. And I really don't know much about what's going on with the space force, to be honest. 
Um, but NASA definitely has its own big plan for getting to the moon and then going to Mars beyond that. Um, and Russia and China are, have been talking a lot about doing a joint space station on the moon. Um, and they're kind of trending in that direction of going to the moon together. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, it does seem like a new space race for sure. And a final question, you mentioned the, the, the ISS uh, it could be around until 2030. Uh, what's the prognosis mm-hmm. for, for that? How, how long is it, is it going to be up there and what comes after that? Yeah, so the ISS is just getting old. Uh, things are kind of starting to not work like they used to. Um, they've discovered some issues with some of the Russian modules. So it's really just it's it's just a limit on the lifetime of it um, and how well the hardware can perform. So the plan uh, is to perform a, a deorbit maneuver to use the boosters on the space station to push it into Earth's atmosphere and have a controlled reentry where it splashes into a really uninhabited area of the ocean. Uh, for safety reasons, obviously, a big space station falling down onto Earth uncontrolled would be really bad. Uh, so that is the plan uh, sometime around 2030. The exact timeline is still kind of up in the air, but that is NASA's plan with or without Russia. Um, and then after that, NASA is looking to commercial space stations. It's uh, funding the development of commercial space stations from three different companies. It just awarded over $400 million of contracts towards that development. And that it's looking to become a customer on a commercial space station rather than the entity controlling a space station, um, and certainly not in partnership with Russia. Morgan McFall Johnson, science and space reporter with Insider. Find her stories at insider.com. And on Twitter, she's Morgan M. Johnson. Thank you very much. Thank you. From United Press International, there's this. The European Union announced Tuesday that it will start rationing natural gas in the face of Russia's pullback on energy over sanctions the bloc placed on the Kremlin for its invasion of Ukraine. European leaders feared that Moscow would not restart the Nord Stream 1 natural gas pipeline to Germany, which was shut down for maintenance. Russia started it again, but only at 40 percent capacity, renewing fears the Kremlin could slash all supplies As the season changes, Russia announced another cut in gas on Monday. That from UPI. The White House today launching a new website, heat.gov. It's a site to help state and local governments and the American public make better decisions when it comes to extreme heat. It's a collaboration of several federal agencies, including the National Integrated Heat Health Information System, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. At today's virtual launch, Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo. You don't have to look far. You don't have to look far at all to see that extreme weather um, is having a massive negative effect on our communities. Extreme weather events are more frequent and more expensive and more lethal Uh, than they ever have been. It's getting worse and worse and worse. More people die every year from heat and heat-related illnesses than any other type of weather event. Uh, And by the way, that's on full display right now in our country and in Europe. So obviously, it's why we're working so hard to prepare Americans and to prevent these tragedies. We don't have to accept this, right? This doesn't have to be this way. Uh, And so that's why you know, we're working as hard as we are here at NOAA and at the Commerce Department. And I should say, I'm just so proud of NOAA. I'm proud. I had, I was with the whole team last week and they're doing incredible work and they have a lead role in this effort, uh, right alongside of the White House, right alongside of the CDC and Secretary Becerra's team. Um, And through the National Integrated Heat Health Information System, We in HHS are going to work across the government with the EPA, with FEMA, with the VA, with the National Park Service to share our best tools and information with decision makers at all levels. And that's important at all levels. So, you know, you could be a mom trying to decide this summer, is it safe for your kids to play outside, to go to camp? You could be a park manager or public works manager determining 
when road repairs can and should be undertaken, or as Ali said, a farmer figuring out when it's okay to be out in the fields. The information on heat.gov is designed to help you. You know, concrete, actionable information at heat.gov to help you, to help you um, navigate the risks associated with extreme weather events. The Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo at today's launch of this website, heat.gov. On the front page of the site, there is a list of the number of people in the U.S. currently under active National Weather Service extreme heat advisories, watches, and warnings. And that number today has been around 39 million. Today is the 32nd anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act being signed into law, an anniversary being recognized both at the White House and on Capitol Hill. In Congress, it is Congressman Jim Langevin, Democrat from Rhode Island, the first quadriplegic ever elected to Congress and co-chair of the Bipartisan Disabilities Caucus that's hosting that celebration. And there's this from White House Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre. So later today, President Biden will virtually join the, the House Bipartisan Disabilities Caucus celebration, marking the 32nd anniversary of the landmark Americans with Disabilities Act, which afforded inclusion and access for disabled Americans. President Biden was proud to co-sponsor this historic legislation as a senator, and his administration has taken a number of steps to advance equity for Americans with disabilities. That includes expanding employment opportunities, ensuring access to education and health, and increasing access to affordable housing, transportation, and broadband. For example, thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law, today the Federal Transit Administration announced new investments to make it easier for people to get on board at the nation's oldest rail public transportation systems. Earlier today, the Vice President also hosted a roundtable with disability rights leaders to discuss access to reproductive health care, where she emphasized the administration's commitment to protecting reproductive rights and self-determination of all individuals with disabilities. Our nation has made great progress since 1990, and the, Bi the Biden-Harris administration will continue working to ensure that the vision of the ADA is fully implemented for all Americans with disabilities. The White House Press Secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, with reporters in the White House briefing room. C-SPAN was there on this day, 32 years ago, 1990, when then-President George H.W. Bush signed this Americans with Disabilities bill into law. Three weeks ago, we celebrated our nation's Independence Day, and today we're here to rejoice in and celebrate another Independence Day, one that is long overdue, and with today's signing of the landmark Americans for Disabilities Act, every man woman and child with a disability can now pass through once closed doors into a bright new era of equality, independence, and freedom. And as I look around at all these joyous faces, I remember clearly how many years of dedicated commitment have gone into making this historic new Civil Rights Act a reality. It's been the work of a true coalition, a strong and inspiring coalition of people who have shared both a dream and a passionate determination to make that dream come true. And it's been a coalition in the finest spirits, a joining of Democrats and Republicans, of the legislative and the executive branches, of federal and state agencies, of public officials and private citizens, of people with disabilities and without. Former President George H.W. Bush uh, on the White House grounds in 1990, 30 Two years ago, today in history. From C-SPAN's American History TV, you can find that program and all of C-SPAN's programs over our 40-plus years at our website, cspan.org, our video library. And thanks for listening to Washington Today. Get more Washington stories sent to you every day by subscribing to C-SPAN's evening newsletter, Word for Word. You can sign up at c-span.org forward slash connect. Have a good night.